Hey there, Java junkies. Happy New Year. Hope you had a fantastic holiday break. And I want to wish each and every one of you an incredible 2019. And I hope that you'll be able to take your mental and your physical health to the next level. And of course, your energy too, so that you can become the best version of you this year. And if you need some extra inspiration to kickstart your new health regime, your exercise and nutrition, getting more sleep, and maybe some meditation, which I highly recommend, you are welcome to check out the Wellness, Health, and Self-Care section of T4C. You can find it on our homepage at Time the number 4coffee.org. Just scroll down until you see all the boxes showcasing various professions and go to the bottom and you'll see wellness, health, and self-care, where we've organized all the episodes we've done with the experts in that space and they're just waiting for you to listen to them. In the spirit of the new year, I have an exciting new promotion to offer Java Junkies, especially those of you who are still in college. For the very first 100 people who email me, I will send you a mini version of our very first T4C ebook called Spilling the Beans. It features five amazing T4C guests. If you're already a T4C fan, then you know that one of the very last questions I try to ask almost all my guests is if you could go back to college and do it all over again, but based on the wisdom you have now, what advice would you give yourself? Well, unless you're a diehard fan, and I hope you are, and plan to listen to each of the dozens and dozens of interviews I've done to date, I thought it would be really useful to college students, those in school right now, to have the answers to that question from a wide range of T4C guests all in one place. And so we've done just that. We've done the hard work for you. And so all you have to do is send me an email to andrea at time, the number four coffee.org and say, I'd love a copy of the mini version of Spilling the Beans. I'd also love to know how you learned about the T4C podcast and what professionals or professions you'd like me to feature on a future episode. This promotion is going to run until we've heard from a hundred Java junkies. So make sure to email me as soon as possible. What a great way to start the spring semester with the wisdom from five T4C guests as to what they'd be doing, what they'd be studying, what they'd be experiencing in terms of the extracurriculars, the clubs, the fraternities or sororities or whatever it is, if they could go back to college and do it all. All over again. Just shoot me an email at Andrea at time the number four coffee.org and we will send you a copy for free. And before we start today's show, I just want to say how incredibly grateful I am to have the opportunity to do what I do. I am so grateful to know that T4C is helping so many young people get a jump start on creating the kind of careers they want to have. So thank you from the bottom of my coffee cup for listening to T4C, and I hope you enjoy the show. Hi there, I'm Andrea Koppel, and it's Time for Coffee, the podcast where you get to hear firsthand what the jobs and careers that interest you the most are really like. Hey there, Java junkies. Hope the new school year is off to a good start and that classes are manageable. And for those of you out in the working world, welcome to the club. But no matter where you are, I hope you've got a mug of your favorite latte or drip nearby because it's time for another caffeinated career conversation. And my guest today, Dr. Arthur Brooks, is definitely someone you're going to want to pay close attention to because even though he spent 12 years as a professional musician in the U.S. and Spain where he played the French horn, he's someone who's always marched to his own drummer. For more details on his incredible resume, please check out the show notes. But suffice it to say that Dr. Brooks dropped out of college after his freshman year 
to pursue his musical passions. And today, well, he has his PhD in economics and he's the president of the American Enterprise Institute, a nonpartisan public policy think tank in Washington, D.C. And he's the best selling author of 11 books, an obvious underachiever. <laughs> Dr. Arthur Brooks, welcome to Time for Coffee. Are you caffeinated and ready to go? Always. Always. I always am. I drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> I this can't is, tell. This, this is the perfect <laughs> podcast for me. Nice to be with you, Andrea. <laughs> Thank you so much. So let's jump right in to the espresso shots. Okay. Quick questions. Yep. Quick answers. Like got it. a minute or so. Uh-huh. uh-huh. What entry-level jobs are available to young people who are eager to break into the public policy world? Okay, so the public policy world has a lot of different parts to it. You can work for the government, you can work for a think tank, uh, you can work for a for-profit agency that's trying to help people in the government. There are lots of ways to do it. The key thing is to do something in public policy. And there are, there are many ways to do that. There are internships on Capitol Hill, there are internships at think tanks, there are anything that basically deals with policy will get you ready for doing something in public policy. You have to do something before you get hired to do it. That's the bottom line. That's the reason for internships is you can go in with something on your resume without expecting to be paid when you have no experience. What is a useful skill or skills that you look for in the people that you hire here at the American Enterprise Institute? Okay, so at AEI and almost any other think tank, young people coming in, the, the, the big mistake that they make when they're applying for a job is not having a skill that we can use immediately. The one skill that we can use immediately is statistics and data analysis. That's the one key thing. And so a lot of people come in and they have, you know, the, uh, they'll, they'll, have, they'll be a philosophy major or political science or something that is more qualitative. And that stuff is great. And that stuff is beautiful and, 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 you know, gives your soul wings. But I need people who can crush the numbers. And so what I recommend is that people who are coming into the public policy world, that they take a statistics and data analysis course and they get good enough at it that they can add value on the very first day. Great. What about a major? Is a person's major a deciding factor in getting their foot in the door here at AEI or any other think tank in the D.C. area? Not really. Um, We find that we pay a lot more attention to how people are doing in school, uh, to a lesser extent, the school that they're going to and what their key interests are. But we have English majors here. We have sociology majors here. We have, I mean, we have people who've majored in in art history and dance at at AEI. And the reason is because they're, they're smart and they're motivated. They really like public policy. Now, if you went through college and graduate school and got your PhD in art history, it'd be very, very unlikely that I would hire (laughs) such a person. But people who are who are coming for internships and here in particular we're looking for high aptitude high motivation and high mission what about a graduate degree and less so for the internship but more in terms of succeeding in this field how critical is it to have that well, it depends on if you're on the staff or the faculty side. So we at AEI, we have about almost 300 full-time employees at AEI. 75 of those are full-time researchers. And I'm really looking for people with PhDs. I'm looking for people who could go and teach at a university, but but choose to do the work of a university researcher, but outside the university. So anybody who's interested in being a professional intellectual anymore, get your PhD. It's really, really important because you're going to be able to, you're going to have the research skills. One of the things that I found as an economist is that almost any economist who doesn't have a PhD just can't read the literature and can't do the work. It's that hard. It's that complex. It's that quantitative. And so anybody who wants to be a professional researcher, there's just really no good reason not to get the doctoral degree. What kind of life experiences are most useful for people starting out in this field? And it's a particularly relevant question for somebody who has a rather unconventional start. Yeah. We find that most people around here have unconventional backgrounds. They've all done weird things. So the key thing about life experiences is is having lots of them, doing a lot of different things, meeting a lot of different people. I, I'm always looking for people who've spent time living overseas. I want to I want to talk to people who have had all different kinds of jobs. These are important things because they give you a sort of a richness, kind of a texture in how you see things. The people that I'm least interested in have done one thing and lived in one place and have you know one particular point of view. I need people who see things from all different perspectives perspectives, who can see this as if they were not from the United States. They can see it from the perspective of somebody who holds a different set of political values than they do. I want people who can put themselves in the place of others. And for that, you need a ton of life experiences. What is the best part for you about being in this profession? And and I ask you that not necessarily just as the president of AEI, but as somebody who cares very much about the world of public policy. Public policy at its best is about serving others. 
public policy at best is trying to give more people a better life. And so at AEI, we have two big mission principles. One is the equality of human dignity, and the other is the limitlessness of human potential. Those are the things that I, I mean, I came here because of that. I'm just completely motivated by that. And I can actually see ways that our ideas, I mean, not every day and not every way, but I can see how these things translate into people living better lives. And that's hugely motivating for me. I mean, that's, that's I've tried to dedicate my life to, to serving others, particularly people with less power than me. And on my best days, and thank God on a lot of days, I can see it. Flip side. Yeah. What part sucks? Well, you know, that's uh, that's a funny thing. This is not something that everybody would answer in the same way. I mean, I came into AEI never having done any management before, which seems pretty foolish on the part of the board of directors that they would hire somebody with no management experience to hire to run a big, you know, old, famous think tank. But, um, you know, sometimes you get lucky. For me, the reason that I had not been in management before is because creative work and, and substantive work in public policy is what's most satisfying for me. So the days that are most frustrating for me are the days when I can't actually get to the work, when I can't actually read the work that my colleagues are doing. I can't put my hands right into the box. And as this stuff has to get has to get done, I mean, sometimes you have to do staff meetings all day, but those are the days. It doesn't suck, but I would say it's uh, those are the days that are least satisfying. What about the best career advice you've ever gotten? So my great mentor was a political scientist by the name of James Q. Wilson. He was maybe the greatest social scientist of the past 50 years. He sat in on my dissertation defense when I was finishing my PhD, which went very poorly, by the way. And he he sort of followed the development of my career, really forward to my first book. And then he was on the on the board of the American Enterprise Institute when I came here as president. So I, he, he saw me all the way through from the beginning until he died in 2012. At one point, I went to him and I asked him for career advice. And I was kind of worried at that point because I was coming up for tenure and I was writing for the Wall Street Journal a little bit in, in, in addition to my books and and, and academic articles. And I'd been kind of identified as a political conservative, which is unusual in my field, or it was when I was teaching at Syracuse University. And, and I said, I kind of feel like this is a danger, political or a, or a career danger for me. He said, ah, don't worry about it. And I said, well, what should I do? He says, be twice as productive and four times as nice as the liberals and you'll be all set. <laughs> Best advice I ever got. <laughs> Are there any movies or fiction books that you think come close to capturing what this profession is like? <laughs> this profession is different for everybody, but to be the president of a think tank actually requires relatively little thinking in tanks and mostly a lot of sitting on planes. So I do about 100 trips a year. I do about 175 speeches a year. And I'm, I'm primarily responsible for kind of being the pitch man for AEI so people understand what we're all about. I also have to raise a lot of money. We have to raise about $50 million a year to keep the doors open. So my job is kind of like running for the Senate, but never getting elected. And and I would say that the, the, the movie that best kind of sums up what my life is all about is up in the air. I don't look like George Clooney, but I kind of live like him in that movie, I mean, except for all the immoral parts. <laughs> <laughs> and then final espresso shot. Hmm. What would people be surprised to learn about your profession? You know, I think that there's a tendency to think that at think tanks in Washington, D.C., we have a tendency to sit around all day and just kind of stroke our chins and say, well, that's very deep and, and have these big intellectual conversations. And the truth of the matter is that there's a lot of work in the field where, we're, where our scholars are, are out talking to public officials and on the Hill. Our poverty studies program, we're working in programs where people are in poverty. Our, we have a physician at AEI, a full-time scholar who's doing work on, on the opiates crisis. Right now, she's living in a little town in Ohio doing field work. Uh, writing a book, working with uh, drug addicts and their families. And so it's the, the fact that we're actually touching the people. As Pope Francis would say, the shepherd needs to smell like the sheep. And I think that it's this is a sheepier profession that people probably realize. Dr. Arthur Brooks, thank you so much for making time for coffee with me and the Java Junkie community today. Delighted. After 10 shots of espresso, I hope that everybody can sleep tonight. Thanks so much for listening to Time for Coffee, where the professionals in the jobs that most interest you always have time to grab coffee 24-7, no matter where you live. I have one quick favor to ask you. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe to Time for Coffee. Thanks so much.